When occultists began to appropriate tarot, there was very little known about the history, and this vacuum in our knowledge endured until 1980, when the first really comprehensive and dedicated study on the history of the cards was published. Sadly, in the intervening couple of centuries, the occultists' mysteries so established themselves in the media and public awareness that, nearly thirty years after the myths should have been forgotten, the actual history remains largely unknown and the myths continue. So let's take a look now at the account of Tarot's past based upon the evidence, and then we can take a good look at how the occultists' account came about and on just what it's based. Playing cards are first seen in Europe in the mid-14th century. They are thought to have originated in the Far East, ultimately from Chinese money games. Coming to us from the Malmuks, our earliest cards are distinctly Islamic in appearance and feature, as our modern packs, 52 cards made up of four suits, each with 10 pip cards and three court cards. The suit symbols were cups, coins, scimitars and polo sticks. Islam, by most interpretations, does not allow the depiction of living things, so the court cards were represented by abstract designs and calligraphy. Polo was not played in Europe at that time, so polo sticks became batons. The court cards were then represented with the figures of a king, a rider and a footman. These changes created what we now call the Latin suits. Cards like these are still used today in countries such as Italy and Spain and parts of South America. The Queen appears to have been invented independently on more than one occasion and may have existed previously in non-Islamic cards. In Italy there was an early pack that featured six court cards in each suit, being a male and a female of each rank. Most of these extra cards were dropped, retaining just the Queen in a 56 card pack and for a time that may have been the regional standard. It was to this pack that in the early mid 15th century a fifth suit of picture cards was added. These picture cards would appear to have taken as their theme a triumph procession, hence their early name Triumphi, meaning triumphs, and from which we get our word Trump. It was the invention of tarot that marked the wider introduction of trumps in card games, although again trumps seem to have been invented independently on more than one occasion. And this is what they were invented for, card games. Games that have grown into a large and varied family, spread through much of continental Europe, and that continues to be played to this day. As I've mentioned, the original name for tarot was Trionfi, but this was soon changed to Taroki probably to save confusion with another game of triumphs that was becoming popular. Perhaps the most plausible origin of this name is the term Tarokus, meaning to play the fool, the fool having an important and unique role in the games. As the cards spread through Europe, this name was often truncated to Tarok, while the French gave us the name that English speakers have inherited, Tarot. Given the modern perception of tarot cards, it may seem a little hard to accept you are very likely to have read about the church suppressing tarot cards and that they had to be used in secret because of their heretical images. However, this is not the case. Tarot games spread across the continent, being played openly without opposition by the church all through the Counter-Reformation. The only real exception to this is in Spain, where it is important to note that the opposition was not from the perception that the images were somehow unchristian or occult, but precisely because they were Christian. The authorities there, the Inquisition, felt it inappropriate to use such images in a card game. We have good reason then to go back and question our initial thoughts. It might help us to take a closer look at two cards that have been widely misunderstood. The female Pope, often renamed the High Priestess by modern occultists, is an excellent example. This must surely be heretical. But no, we are looking at the cards through modern eyes with a vision coloured by popular myth. If we are to understand what the images represent, then we must look at them in the context of their origin, Renaissance Italy. If we look at the religious art of that time, we find that the female Pope was an established figure in Christian art, being used to symbolise such things as the New Covenant and the virtue of faith. There was no heresy, 
which explains why there was no opposition. Another card that is often cited as having esoteric meaning is the hanged man, perhaps because it is difficult to see just what overt and obvious meaning it could ever have had. What are we to make of a man suspended by one foot, often holding money bags? Some have suggested it to be Judas, though he would surely have hung himself by his neck. Others have suggested it to be the virtue of prudence. Indeed, the list of offerings is long and varied. However, if we look at the card in context, we find a different story and no mystery at all. The title of Hanged Man was given to the card by French card makers, but we know from written sources that in Italy it was called the Traitor, and little wonder as this is how Italians used to execute traitors, suspended by one foot and left to die rather slowly and publicly. As for the money bags, we can find an explanation from another practice of the time, that of shame pictures. It was the practice to shame those who betrayed a trust by employing an artist to draw that person's likeness hung as a traitor. This would then be publicly displayed. Often this was done in the case of bad debtors, hence we can suppose the money bags. The hanged man then is not just a traitor but essentially just a bad debtor. The beginning of the 18th century saw a big change in tarot in many countries. At this time German card makers began to produce French suited tarot cards that also gave up the traditional trumps in favour of a number of themes such as animals or local scenes. This offered two advantages. The first was economic. Regular French suited playing cards had existed since the 15th century and had quickly become the dominant pattern in Europe. While Latin suits required costly woodblocks and hand colouring which was labour intensive, the French suits required only a simple stencil to reproduce the pips making production much cheaper. Additionally, by dropping the traditional trumps, the card makers could do more to show off their own skills, as well as create cards with themes that might appeal to their regional customers. This new pattern of tarot cards has now become the dominant form for gameplay. All of this is a far cry from anything we see in the popular media, and I'm happy to report that the games continue to be played throughout much of continental Europe today. To be fair, we should note that in internet communities there are a number of tarot readers who do, at least to some extent, accept the account of tarot's origin given by historians. However, their acceptance has done nothing to impact on the public perception and a great many more still promote the myths.